Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambudasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambudasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambudasa. How much to him, the worthy one, holy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, so I hope you all had a good week. Uh, had you uh, had some smiles to pass around and things like that. Um, this week, uh, I wanted to throw out a question and answer to sort of hear what you are doing with your practice. And um, I wanted to... Uh, any questions that you have about the practice to throw up and and uh, let's see what we come up with. We we're looking at questions and answers people have and we're looking at challenges, solutions, we're looking at how do we use this in life? What do we do with it? We're um, seeing uh, how do you find uh, Buddhism useful in life compared to other uh, spiritual paths, which are lots and varied, but in comparison to um, mainstream religious organizations and things like that. How do you see Buddhism? I'm curious because we had a lot of questions this week that came in about certain things. And I'm curious where you're at with this. So I'm gonna ask each one of you just to throw something out there. Who wants to try first? Anybody got a question? Hmm? Hello? May, what, what is it that gets to you the most? Or what do you think about the most? Um, I'm trying to think uh, what questions I wrote down before because sometimes I get questions that, usually I get questions that pop up uh, in the middle of the day. Like <laughs> very, very odd. Like I could be, uh, cleaning or uh washing the dishes or yeah, uh, exactly driving <laughs> uh I, I should be focusing on driving obviously uh but uh it's it's and it's it's very random it it could be uh you know anything from um i'm just trying to think what question i had and it's odd when I have a question when I'm driving because I can't be like, you know, pulling over and writing it down somewhere. Or, um, uh, sorry. Maybe it's time, it's time to put the record button on the first part of the phone, <laughs> the front page of the phone. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll, I'll let others have a go. I'll try and check my notes if I wrote something down before. Okay, Jay, got a question? Not at this stage, Sister Kim. I will also wait. Firstly, I should thank you for the the the, the book you the small leaflet you circulated this morning. It was really wonderful. <laughs> you like that? Yeah, That's we beautiful. had we had fun with that. This is from a whole lot of conversations that went back and forth for a year's period of time or more with Deepa, and and then she was collecting them sort of in a box, you know. And uh, then she put them together, and we talked about it. So let's make a little booklet, and this came out. It's very cute. I think it's really, really went well. You know, quite, quite not, nice. Not nice. overdone, not too involved, but yeah. she knows that it's a question. I really don't like to um, give talks and have people ask me that question because it can go like all over the place, you know? And um, I, I really don't like to spend my time talking about that a lot, but that's really 
she hit it right. She got it right on the nose, exactly pulling out all the pieces that were the most important part. So the only only yeah. thing, only question I would like to ask is about uh, sure. the, 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 the craving start with the tension in the mind, the body or the mind. But uh, with all collectedness, I couldn't feel any tension, but it just immediately it just flies in these thoughts flies in, you know, you don't realize that there is a, that that tension is very, very difficult to be seen. Okay, let me just explain to you the, um, the tension for a second here. I, I disconnected this now. I have so been honestly, working. Honestly, working. The, yeah. honestly, first time when I started the retreat, um, I was actually looking for the tension. Where is the tension coming in? Rather than focusing, uh, having an attention on the uh, object of meditation. The thing is this, when you first start practicing, you cannot see that. You cannot, okay? It'd be very unusual if you could. Because uh, the level of noticing the tension in the arising craving is directly proportionate to how high or low the tension is in your body while you're practicing. And so if a person is sort of struggling to see that point, let me show you this if I can get to the, where is the right pen? <laughs> they give me different pens. Let's see if I can do this for you. We're gonna test this pen out and see if I can show you for a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, see, the thing is that, um, there I go. Um, when, and I want a dark color here, dark color here, let me take this one. You know, when you start, when you start practicing, you know, you have not been able to draw. <laughs> I love this. Okay, there we go. Okay, so you have two people, okay? And these two people You know, these two people, these two people are here and they're the meditators. And what's happening with these, these people, I, I know you've seen me draw this before. And um, they start out with this much tension in their body. They come in from the city. They have this much tension in their body. Both of them have the same amount. And when they sit down, let's just look at the twin character. In this case, let's just look at the twin character. And we'll say that when something, uh, when something you're practicing and then something happens where a thought comes up that looks like that, and your curiosity butts in and you, you, you change your direction. Your direction is kind of like here in front of you, but you, you change your direction and you go off towards looking at that. And the instructions are that when this happens, you are supposed to release the attention off of this and you're supposed to uh, let go and relax and smile and come back. Now, if you, in the case of the twin, so this is twin over here. I usually put them on the on the left, so I got to remind myself. This is twin, and when they let go of the attention off of this, and they they let go, they then relax. Now, when they relax, this is the interesting part, because when they relax, um, the um, let's see. Uh, 
I, I, I think I'm learn need to practice what I'm doing with the, okay. Okay, when they let go and they relax, what we're trying to show you is when you're practicing twim, this, this goes down a little bit. So the next time the person is practicing, they're practicing here. And then the next time something pulls them away, it goes down marginally again. And now when they come back and continue practicing, they're practicing here and so forth like this, okay? And where they're always moving for a reduction of the tension and the tightness in the mind and the body with the idea that Nibbana is when there's no more. The ability, well, we shouldn't say Nibbana, actually we shouldn't say Nibbana. We should say, um, we should say we need the eraser <laughs> there. Um, you know, we shouldn't say that it's Nibbana that you're moving towards. You are, you're moving towards the experience of Nibbana. But what you're trying to do the whole time you're practicing is you're attempting to, um, to reach cessation, state of cessation. Now, if we were to say, what is the state of cessation? Cessation of what? This is the thing. Okay. And it's cessation of all tension and tightness. When you turn off, there's a cessation of tension and tightness. So when they, uh, you know how we draw the line like this, sometimes we say we're going along one, two, three, four rupas and infinite space and infinite consciousness and nothingness and neither perception nor non-perception, uh, okay? When we're, when we're, um, we're talking about going like this along those, the jhana line, the, it, which is considered the path, okay? When you're going through that and you go toward the end, then you're gonna fall off and you fall off when the conditions are right, you move from here to here, the conditions are right, you're here to here, the conditions are right to here to here, it's like a game, you know? And when the conditions get right and the conditions are just letting go, letting go, letting go and relaxing, letting go, relaxing, letting go, relaxing. That's what you're doing to the tension and tightness in your mind. And you're letting it go until you get to the right, the conditions, they always say, get to the right conditions arise so that you can get to here. And conditions arise to so get to here. Conditions arise to so get to here. Conditions arise to so get here. Conditions arise for you to fall off and fall down into cessation. Then what happens is when you turn off and you go down really fast, you turn back on. And when you turn back on, that's when you rise up as you're turning back on and the opening happens here. And the opening is the experience of Nibbana, okay? Now let's get something straight here because there's a lot of mix up about this right now. Uh, <laughs> Nibbana is a city, Nibbana is a place, Nibbana is the next country we're going to, <laughs> you know, Nibbana is this, Nibbana is that. Nibbana turns out to be the experience of this opening, okay? And the best I can explain it to you in modern times is you just rebooted your mind. I really like this description, like rebooting your computer when you get in trouble and you're stuck. That's me, <laughs> and I can't make it work. <laughs> so if I have to reboot, what happens to the OS system in your computer is you reboot to it almost like a default and then turn it back on in hopes that that's all that was wrong and it's erased. And now we start again from the beginning and we can, and things will operate, okay? Well, that's kind of like what this is. That's kind of like what this is. It's like a rebooting here. This is where you turned the computer off, where you fell down here, where you rebooted it. And it takes, you know, sometimes a couple of minutes to go doot, 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 and come back on. Well, those doot, doot, doots were the links of dependent origination going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And you're back on again fully and you go and open the mind. It opens into a default state. And the default state is your computer's there. Wow, thank you. <laughs> now I can run. <laughs> and for us, what happens is we have this opening where we can see like little kids again briefly, but we can see just like a little child sees. 
we can smell and taste and hear and touch just like the experience of a young child. Now, how long does it last? How long are you going to take care of it? How long are you going to take care of that newborn baby? You see? And they're just beautiful when they come out and they start and everything is just wonderful until, until you have one with colic or one that can't stop pooping or, you know, well, it's the same thing here. It's just beautiful when it starts out and you see this fresh thing. And in our case, how long is it going to be when, when you are, um, when you are here in this, in this state now, this nebonic state, okay, how long are you going to be like that? depends on this. This is the part, the past and the future. And you are, are here, like right here. You have taken, remember the little car? I'm always showing you the little car like this, right? Like that. And I'm always showing you, this is your little car and you're, you're driving along like this in life. But the problem is your car is usually full of stuff from the past and you're driving cautiously because you're worried about what's in the future. So you don't just drive. Now, all of a sudden, the car is just like a brand new vehicle all over again. How long is it going to be before you put the past, bring it up and start massaging it again? How long is it going to take before you start worrying about the future more than you need to in a single day? And how long is that going to take to botch the car up again and not have it run quite right see so this is what's going on in this whole process now the question is there how do i see the arising of the of the uh how do i see the arising of the craving sooner the tension and tightness early now i'm going to show you something with this other character over here for just a minute because when he when he has a hindrance come up and here's a strange one for him over here. Okay, there's a little strange guy. When he is moving from his direction, let's say he was meditating in this direction and then his attention is pulled over, it's not like there's only my attention is here or my attention is here. Your attention can be most of the time, it's number one for the beginner. It's always, it's always right here, okay? Because you don't notice you're off your object of meditation till you're on the hindrance. But the second one could have been that you noticed it when you were moving over towards it. And the third one could have been, you could have developed well enough that as this, as this um, tension is reducing, the further down it reduces, the faster you can detect the arising of the craving. Do you get it? You see what I'm saying, Jay? So the craving is arising, but this person oh. can't really see it if this is how much tension they have here, they can't notice it until it pushes, like it pushes, it pushes above this. Then they start to see it. So they, it's hard for them to catch it before it moves over. Do you get what I'm saying? So the craving, has these three levels that you're developing through. And so wh where is the person when, when um, where is the person when, when the person, uh, how do I say it? When the person is uh, reached the stage where they automatically have the six hours working, where are they? They're right here. They're right here. Okay, right there. They sense it. They can even be sensing it rising from the heart upwards to the mind. They feel, you know, you feel things. This is interesting. You should think about this. Do, when you feel something, do you feel it in your head first or your heart first? And most people will answer me and they'll say, I felt it in my heart first. And then I registered in my head and I started thinking about it. 
And this is where we, we think, we're not sure, but we believe that the, in the time of the Buddha, they believed the location of the mind wasn't here. The location of the mind was in the heart. So this is where heart mind comes in. Uh, because we sense things before we react to anything, process very quickly and react. We actually feel it in our heart, don't we? Think about this and test it for yourself. Okay. And so this person over here, whose tension is this high, can't feel anything till here. But if this person has their tension is, uh, is down lower, you know, their tension has gotten to this point, like real low. And, and your, your chakras also, let's see what your chakras are, your chakras are running, your chakras are running through your body like this, you know, through it like that, okay? So depending, you might feel it in your gut, you might feel it in your heart, you might feel it in your throat. You could before it reaches up a place where the brain is gonna, do something about it. You see, do you see what I'm trying to say? So I'm trying to, I'm trying to show you the differentiation of the different ways that people are experiencing this. And why should I, why shouldn't I struggle to see it? Don't, don't struggle to see it. Just keep six Ring. Just let go, relax, smile, come back. And you'll get the lower the tension goes, the sooner you can uh, sense the arising of uh, the tension and tightness of the craving. And pretty soon the mind, the brain puts this together, puts it together that when tension is arising, you actually want me to forgive whatever this is and just with loving kindness, uh, you know, let it go, relax, smile, come back. That's what you really want me to do. And here's the interesting thing, our brain loves swim <laughs> our brain the more we use it our brain likes it because we are uh, we are in the process of our um in the process of our um how do i get back to you guys i can't remember oh here you go okay that's enough of that so our our uh brain in this practice we do not pressure the brain to push to how do I say it? We don't direct our energy through our, our head so much to make thinking happen and sort of, uh, which leads to a reaction, a personal reaction. And so when we stop doing that with our brain, taking things, changing to an impersonal perspective and remembering, looking at the world the way it's naturally happening, uh, that we can use this impersonal perspective, then there is not so much tension. And um, if we don't have the tension in our mind, we simply, the brain gets used to that comfortable way of being in more open mind, giving you more ability to stop quickly. You should, when you're practicing, you should get to a place where it's easier for you to work. I don't care what you're doing. If you're doing comp computer programming or analysis or bookkeeping or uh, office management work or manufacturing work, you should, what simultaneously happens with the development of this practice uh, is there's more openness for your mind to use the potential of your brain. And so you can stay in a focused place without stress though, without headaches, without exhaustion because your brain is cooperating with you, okay? You're not pushing it around. And if something comes up, you don't go, I have to stop that. I have to make that stop. We don't do that. Why? Well, because we taught you the knowledge behind the hindrances. And by teaching you that knowledge of what is the nutriment of the hindrance, then we're showing you if you take away the, the supply for this hindrance, take away the nutriment, the food, then it fades away and the pressure all goes away. Okay, so to answer your question, how do I get to see that? It's not a priority to see it as much as keep practicing 
And if, you, or if you're practicing on a daily basis, keep the, the pieces in mind. You don't have to think, think, think about all this stuff you know, all the time. That's not what I'm really saying. Um, what I'm actually saying to you is you have a lot of information when you're practicing with us. We give you a lot of stuff, but gradually what the brain is doing with it is saying, oh, look, that's another piece of the puzzle. Oh, that one fits to this one. Oh, and this one, it fit right there with that one. And they hooked to that. And all of a sudden you see all this stuff in Buddhism is actually a jigsaw puzzle that actually comes together and it goes just like this and can turn into an actual weaving, an actual weaving like this. You see, it can hook together. At first, it seems like I'm throwing you into a bucket with lots of stuff. And there are many monks that feel we cannot teach you this stuff. This is only to be taught to monks because it's a brain, it's a brain puller. It's like a, you're going to think about it all the time. How do I hook this to that, to that, to that, to that, to that, to that? <laughs> and yeah, and you think about, oh my gosh, I got to go to Abhidhamma class now. I got to go to the Pali class. I can only learn it if I know Pali and da, 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 and it goes on and on and on. But you actually can establish the motions and the movement of your practice down the path as a meditator to help open the brain so that you can then learn Pali and then go in and look at it from the Pali perspective. And if you want to do Abhidhamma later, after you've got your practice going, certainly do it, but you won't get as many headaches, you see. Abhidhamma is so interesting to me, you know, because the Abhidhamma if I started rattling some of it off to you, you'd say, well, we know about that. We know about that. We, we know about that part. And yes, you do, because the Abhidhamma sources from the text, what he was teaching in the suttas, six of this, six of that, seven of that, five of that. And Gutra Nikaya is a good example of a source book for Abhidhamma. Think about it, ones, twos, threes, fours, fives, up to twelves, you know? And I'm thinking, why are they uh, sort of pitting these things against each other when, uh, you know, right now uh, there's a thing about Theravada might be fading away, you see? And there's a big push toward uh, Mahayana it might be pushing more to be the big, big vehicle. Yeah, but you know where the big vehicle came from? <laughs> this is what's funny. The big vehicle came from the elder school and that's the Theravada. The big vehicle didn't just form itself out there in no man's land in the dark. They came down and took the suttas back and then wrote their own, their set of agamas and the agamas, that's why they look so much like the suttas because they came from the suttas. So it's like saying, well, the child is growing up and, and the mother only got as far as eighth grade, you might say, or, or say the, through, through high school, but the child is going to go through college and get degrees and master's degrees and all of this stuff. So then the, they're superior to the mother. Are they? Are they superior to the mother? Should they just dismiss the mother? <laughs> you, know? you know, and I'm thinking this is this is a wrong kind of thinking. We want to be very, very careful because remember, after the Buddha is gone, what happened? You know, we had the preservation oral and the practice still operating as meditators, but then the moment they wrote it down, they caused a division and a permanent competition between academics and meditators. See, and they divided the whole structure. And so this is like uh, somebody said, um, my, my husband got his, uh, I remember his my husband got his master's degree and uh, he said, you know, uh, what is more important, though, uh, when you put two people on the stage in front of a whole bunch of young people, and one is a jet fighter pilot, and the other one is a guy with his PhD, which one are they going to go spend time talking to? They're going to go to the jet fighter pilot, and he's in his mask and everything with his tube coming out in his face. Wow, that's really cool, you know. And I'm there like, yeah, but what what happened to the to the academic who had the core of the knowledge, the body of the knowledge, and everything just got left over here. You see, 
some people get upset about that. It's it's sort of like yin and yang. We don't need yin. I'm yin, you're yang. You sit over there, I'll sit over here. Let's disconnect. Well, that doesn't work so well. <laughs> you, see, you should look at yin and yang sometime. Look it up and spend a little time with it on the computer. Yin balances yang and yang balances yin and yin, yang, yang, yin. <laughs> you, know, you can't, you, you know, this thing, what is it like this? And like, I can't do it like this. Yeah. Like this and like this. Yeah. Like that, like these two, like that. See yin, yang. <laughs> and I always thought, you know, how, uh, let's see you pump that guy's heart and save his life. If your hands are not like this, when you do it, let's see you do it with one hand. Can't do it. <laughs> you can't do it. So this whole thing of men and women, yin and yang, <laughs> and the parts of the Buddhist uh, teaching and, and, and this school and that school and vegetarians and eat, eater, eat meat eaters and all the rest of this, you know, or mixed diet. And just something in our DNA, I keep telling you, there's something wrong. We, I don't know if we can ever get to a place where I can just sit under the Buddha head and just relax by the tree, you know, because there's somebody saying you need to sit to the left, you need to sit to the right. Photographers are going to argue which is the better picture. It's amazing, you know, and the, but the best photography in the whole world is when somebody takes their camera out and uh, they just start snapping pictures. And I have a friend who's a photographer in the Netherlands. You can ask her what happened. She came to visit me in Sri Lanka. And I was uh, teaching at the, the school in Paula Kelly, and I was studying, auditing the master's courses, and, and I was teaching dependent origination. And we're, we're up at where I was staying, there's these two rooms. And one room has a, a window here and a desk in front of it. And I was sitting in front of the desk. And it was in the evening and the sunlight was coming through the window and it hit me and I was wearing a, uh, I was wearing a purple robe at that point, purple robe. And um, she took this picture as she walks around the, the house and the upstairs, she's taking pictures here and pictures there and pictures there. And she goes, turns in the doorway, she goes click and takes this picture. Now I can show you that picture. I don't know if um, I can find it right now to do it. Maybe I could pull it up before we finish. But I'll show you this picture because it's, it's really remarkable what happened to this picture. She goes back to her studio when she's taking all the, all the stuff that she took and she's looking at it. She decides this picture is so perfect. It is so perfect with the light shining down on me and me studying the texts in front of me at this desk with nothing else in the room, but the, but the light coming in the window. And it's absolutely perfectly focused. She turns it into National Geographic to the yearly competition. And this picture comes out number 10 out of like a half million pictures. Number 10 is how high it got. And so in the Netherlands, they celebrated this because they have an artist. Now, I'll be darned if I can remember the name of the artist. It's the period of Rembrandt. And this artist was a Dutch artist. And he was doing these paintings. And his thing was he did it all in blues. He painted it all in blues. So they, they took this. Everyone was excited about it. I still have that paper somewhere in a box. It's a newspaper, like a whole page. And the question for the audience is, you know, what is the name of this paint? Is this painting, is this painting an authentic painting by and the name of that artist? Now, the trick to this whole thing is, what was I doing when I was sitting by the desk? There's a famous painting that he painted and it was a priest sitting there studying the Bible in a desk, very similar with the light coming through the window shining on the priest and the desk. But the difference with this picture was something else was on the desk. A baby computer was on the desk and I was reading the computer. Yeah, a little baby one, you know, a small one, like eight inch screen was sitting there the same size as the Bible would have been. And I was reading that and I was, I was studying it. I mean, the picture's remarkable. And just people phoned her and they 
talked with her. It was, it was really cool. It helped her a lot with her business. But the funny part of the picture was this all happened accidentally, Jay. See, it all happened accidentally. It wasn't pre-planned. It was very natural. She click in this room, click in that room, click in this room, click at the sun over here, click in the room where I was sitting. You see? So what I'm trying to come back to here is just naturally trust the practice to start the development of your uh, everything as you're moving down the path. Trust it, it moves. If you were, if you were practicing every day right now, and you went on vacation, just stopped for three months. When you come back and you start to practice again, there's a big surprise for you when you get home because you will probably jump ahead of where you were before. And you're thinking, how could that have happened? And then if you start watching more closely inside, you're going to see because when you started practicing and the brain started to open, start you, you let it get free and then it knew it was free and it started to develop more, uh, more uh, supportive of you, more helpful for you. It's like it fell in a river and the river is floating towards the ocean. And just because you went on a vacation doesn't mean that it stops moving inside of you. I've had this experience. And when I came back after about three months and I started again, I was amazed that where I was was not where I left. How did that happen? Because it's moving and once it's moving and developing inside of us, it's very exciting. It's been turned on and turning this on inside is turn, telling your brain that your whole life and everything, how everything functions was actually very, very natural. Very natural and impersonal. See, that's what that's what's a thing about this. You see, and so you don't worry about seeing this, but you will see it at the point where your tension in your body lowers and lowers. And then if you keep supporting it, and if you're not sitting quite long enough, start sitting a little longer. Sit ten minutes longer. See what happens. And um, sometimes that's enough to get you into a more clear area to understand what's happened. Some of you I know here, some of you have practiced uh, shifting it around and seeing what happens if you increase it 10 minutes, you see? I mean, an hour is divine, but we don't all have an hour before we're gonna go to work. If some of us don't, then you take, you, you try to take, 30 minutes also, we've always said 30 minutes is the minimum, but then you have the 40 minute wonder <laughs> and everybody's working at 30 minutes and this person can't make it work. And finally it dawns on you, oh, it's a 40 minute wonder. So you say, give me 10 minutes more and bingo, they just got out of the corral and they're just galloping down the path. They're going. So don't let yourself get in a rut if you are practicing between 30 minutes and an hour, okay? An hour is more stable and consistent. Um, and then once on the weekend, if you can go somewhere where you can go without a clock, because I think a part, an important part of all this is to experience a time slip. And a time slip, I call it a time slip, is where suddenly you say, you know, Sister Kama, I just discovered that time doesn't exist. <laughs> you come to me and tell me that. And I say, oh, you just experienced a time slip. And, you and this is when you come out of a sitting and it feels like you only sat for maybe 20 minutes or maybe 30, but actually sat for one or two hours. But, you, but you, it felt like it couldn't have been more than 10 minutes or 20 minutes long. And what that is, is time slip. Your brain got to a spot where it just forgot there was any information about time in your head at all. And it just, it isn't an element, it left, see? And that's valuable, because now remember you had a time slip. And once you had this time slip, it becomes much easier for you to sit, okay? Because mind, 
It's just not concern. If you set the buzzer, okay, it's going to go along. It's going to go along and operate. You can stop when you hear the buzzer, but it's not going to be, there's not going to be a tenseness. When is the buzzer going to ring? Da, 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 so much. It's going to let you be. Yeah. So does that answer your question? We went around the block with it, <laughs> but I wanted you to understand the anatomy of it and how to see it. You guys want to see that picture? You want to see it? You want to see it? All right, wait a second. Let me see if I can pull it up for you. Now this is tricky. Oh yeah, okay. Fred, I have this back again. So I think I can do it this way. Let me see if I have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go here. Oh, I know. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. That one doesn't have it. Okay. I think here's one. Okay. All right, so let me go back here and come back to you and go into the share and pull this up right here. And here's the picture. This is the picture, but let's put it up on the screen here. And we'll call it a slideshow and we'll say from the current slide. See, that's the picture. It's gorgeous, isn't it? So what she did when she uh, got all this acclamation, she was all excited and everything. She, get, she gave the picture to me, so I own the picture. <laughs> so I said, wow, I never owned a picture before. So this is the picture, I own it. But this is what it was. And it looks very close to the picture that was, take, was painted by this artist. And this was a priest instead of me, it was a priest. And the window is very similar. The light was shining in and he had a, a sort of easel thing with a Bible on it and he was reading the Bible. It's almost an identical setup like me imitating him. But you see the blues in it, everything. It made everybody really stop and think, where is this? What castle is it in? What monastery is it in? Everybody was writing all kinds of things. Which picture was this? And finally, somebody said, but wait a minute, that's a computer in front of her. <laughs> so it's not the 1500s. This is just, uh, just uh, a picture that is from here and now. And <laughs> <laughs> and they had a lot of fun with this picture, playing the game at the newspaper in Amsterdam with it. Yeah, that's what happened. So anybody have another question for me? Another one. Hmm? Everett is thinking. <laughs> I am. <laughs> what, what are you thinking about? What are you thinking about? <laughs> um, I, I, I was thinking about uh, well, well, uh, two things. I recently I was not feeling well for like w one or two days. Yeah. And, and after that, uh, it wasn't serious at all. It was like very light. Um, but after that, for like a week or maybe a week and a half, um, I, I had uh, some trouble sitting for more than half an hour. That, that was uh, that was kind of weird. Um, uh, so. But that sort of bounced back now, so that's nice. Mm -hmm. that's weird that happened. And the other thing is, that's a, that's actually more of a question. Is um, right now when I meditate during um, week weekdays, um, I meditate in the evening. But I I would ideally I I would like to move it into the morning, but uh, I I just can't seem to to uh, just can't seem to do it. Or, what what is your living situation? You married with kids, or are you single, or what? A single. I, okay. I have all the time in the world. What time? What time do you go to bed at night? Mm, Ten o'clock. Oh, okay. And what time do you usually get up? Mm, six o'clock. Okay, you're pretty prime. Okay, so um. 
Okay, so what you try, try it on the weekend sometime, okay, um, on a Friday, uh, you, you set your alarm to get up at three o'clock. Okay. Now, let me ask you a couple questions about getting up in the morning. Are you fresh immediately or are you groggy and then you have to get fresh? <laughs> I, um, as soon as I, five minutes after I get up, I, I feel like, you know, okay. But until I do that, I, I feel pretty groggy. So that's that's the difficulty there. Okay, when you get up at three o'clock, then you walk in the bathroom and you splash water on your face. Okay, if you want to keep a bottle of cold water, you don't have to do the shock thing. But you know, if if just washing your face at three o'clock, and I want you to try to sit from three to four. Then if you want to lie back down until six o'clock, you can. You know, if you want to. I want you to experience what it's like one time of sitting through the zero consciousness in your area, okay? So we call this, um, the gurus, uh, this one guru, he's great in India. He says, come sit with me from 3.20 to 3.40 and you will be enlightened. <laughs> and what he's talking about is having the experience of, of sitting at a time when there's just no consciousness active around you in the apartments or the building or anything in the parking lot, nothing's happening. You see, nothing is happening. Where do you live? Um, I live, uh, well, sort of at the edge of the city, uh, Leiden, if you ever want to visit. It's, uh, well, you know, the Netherlands, is, it's pretty densely populated anyway, but uh, it's not, not quite suburb. So pretty busy okay. apartment buildings. But you're kind of away from nightlife stuff that would be happening like that late at night, right? You right. kind of, okay. See, so just try this out sometime. And actually I got into the habit of this. I wanted to go to bed an hour earlier so that I could actually do it and then not go back to bed. <laughs> You know, because uh, if you if you do it and, and you get through this really remarkable sitting with just nothing stirring at all, nothing. And um, so what is your object of meditation right now? The directions, you're using the directions? Yes, yes. Okay, so go, are you sitting with three minutes or five minutes? Um, well, like a few weeks ago, it was, it was more like, uh, oh, with five minutes. I thought you meant... Uh, the, to the two to each to each direction like five minutes yeah okay um so did you ever have the experience of blacking out did you ever go through one time to cessation or not yet oh not yet no okay fine all right so you stick with five minutes to each direction and then when you you do it five to the front five to the back five to the right five to the left five into the nadir, into the ground, into the center of the earth, and then five minutes up, and then all around, when it starts spinning it around, you're sending to all beings in all directions, okay? And pretend that you're inside a globe, like you're inside a great big um, habitat globe, like you're inside. And so it's all the beings are all around you in all directions. You see, so that when you're sending, you're, you're emanating this energy out, they're just able to feel it. And you have to smile a lot when you do this to all the beings in all directions. You just kind of giggle it. I'm sending, this is a funny story. Before the, uh, before the astronomical people told us that the space is not dark, <laughs> you know, uh, we were saying, send light into the universe and pretend that you are the electric company giving everybody, all the beings in all the universe, you're giving them the light. And then these guys came out at MIT or this place in California, the big observatory, and they said, you know, they got this new telescope and went beyond where they were before. And they said, you know, it's not dark out there. <laughs> <laughs> I told all these students they were carrying the torch into the universe to light everything up. And one of them called me and said, well, now what do we do? And I said, just enjoy the light, enjoy the light. <laughs> you know, and think of everybody smiling. So you're sending, you're taking your smile. And the more you smile, the more people pick up the energy around you. All these beings are getting this 
when you're practicing this way, it's a form building of life energy. See, it's not a, a selfish energy. It's a life energy, life-giving energy. So it's just shining off of you. And you're in this globe and you have fun with it. Like I'm inside here and I'm going to just be a candle that's shining out to everyone. And you keep doing that. And then if you decide to walk, if you have to get up and you have to walk, you walk. And when you're walking, you still have this bubble of meta around you that's shining into the universe. And you keep smiling and keep playing this game of sending it around you all the time. Yeah? Yeah. It, it's, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. It, it, when I uh, send it out, it sort of feels like uh, I, I'm in a, a bubble, yes. But it sort of feels like the bubble itself is um, is a sort of a limited size, but there is like a, a, a big sort of ocean out there. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. But um, what? Uh, okay. What I want you to play a game uh, where you are inside a meta bubble when you're doing this. And that's the smallness you're feeling. This is, I'm, it's mine and it's part of my life force. And then when you start sending it to all beings, break the shell and let it shine all out. Okay. Just break this, break this shell that's around you and just let it all come out when you start doing it to the whole universe. Okay. And okay. smile a whole lot. Okay. Yeah. And then see how you feel. You might feel like having coffee, eggs, pancakes, and everything else. <laughs> Or you might feel like, I'm just going to lie down another hour and a half. <laughs> See how long you can sit. You know, you do it one, one night a week. Try this. You see? Okay. Have you ever sat without a, a, a timer at all? Like sat to see how, what would happen if I sat? I'll sit uh -huh. until I'm, you say, I'll, I'm going to sit until I'm done. And just say that to your brain and just sit without any restrictions. Have you ever done that? Not quite like that. I, I sit in front of like a clock. So when I open my eyes, I sort of see, well, it's just, it's usually about the same time when I open my okay, eyes. Okay, you have to be careful. If you've been doing that a lot, you won't need the clock. It'll just, you'll just stop at half an hour. You got to be careful about that because you're, tra you're training your brain. Remember, this is what I do. And I do it for 30 minutes. You got that? If your clock breaks, don't worry. Your brain says, I'll open my eyes. <laughs> You see, your brain is really listening. He's playing with you, you know? So, so you have to be careful and see, try at least one day a week to cut yourself free of the clock. Just put it in the drawer and sit. See what happens. Then if you have to, you feel like I got to get up, I got to walk. Then you walk, sending it to all directions, to all beings and keep smiling in anything that comes or feels or presses or is tense. You just... Smile at it. Hi, how you doing? Yeah, you can come with me, but don't bother me. <laughs> you know, you just let it be. You can be here. I know you're here. It's like that thing, the line that's always there. This stuff is good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end. And you're very pleasant in the beginning. I know the instructions is pleasant now and it'll be pleasant later, maybe, and then it'll fade away. But you, you, you can hang out with me or you can come up and go away. <laughs> just leave it alone. Make fun of these things. Laugh at anything that stresses you out, okay? It's like, get, get loose and play. Think of yourself as a two-year-old who really wants to go to the beach and you're bugging your mom to take the shovel and the, and the, and the little bucket and go down and make the sandcastles. Come on, let's go. <laughs> and just go out there and start sending it to the universe. Play with it, okay? Yeah, that's good. I like it when you smile. <laughs> Good. Okay, so give it a try. Anybody else? Hey, Sarma, you got to have something good for me. Come on. <laughs> no, I don't have any questions. No questions. Come on. Yes. <laughs> How can that happen? Not from Sarma. <laughs> no questions. Okay, P, Pi. Is it pi? I think it's pi. What do you think? I think it's pi. P-I. Please tell me because I don't want to make a mistake. Yeah, uh, 
it's just in the chat like pi so you're right oh okay okay um let's see paul how about you how's things going in south wales okay yeah i've got no question though sorry <laughs> yeah I want to tell you how much I appreciate what you're doing with Deepa and Paul is hanging our talks up, you know, he's the one that does uploading and sometimes probably doesn't want to talk to me because they're too long or something. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, but he's doing a great job in helping Deepa with getting the talks up and trying to, uh, you know, shorten them sometimes and we're doing really good work with this thank you paul for everything you're doing so i do I enjoy doing it thank you for giving me the opportunity no oh, it's just wonderful it's wonderful Fendi, how are you doing uh good sister yeah you got any questions uh yeah i i got one so uh, so in one sutta, uh, the Buddha explained that if uh, if one breaks the the precepts, then then uh, they'll go to the lower realm, realm like the hell. Uh, but uh, how how do we know for for sure, uh, sister? Because uh, like uh, maybe like uh, when someone steals something but maybe very small things or or, or when uh, someone uh, uh, maybe just do a, a wrong speech wrong speech like that so how how could uh, someone uh, speak wrongly and then uh, go to the raw realm realm how, how do we know about it the the precepts are an operative game while you're living okay mm -hmm. you break uh you know there's lots of things that go on that we think we need to clean ourselves up as much as possible the the uh progress on the main path of really getting to the total end result like arahat and fruition is on a path where um there just isn't anything going on anymore with breaking precepts at all when we teach you, when I teach, you, here's what happens in in uh, the Sunday school in the beginning. What should be happening is that precepts and hindrances are taught side by side. Now, let me say this about um, heaven and hell for just a minute. Last night I was teaching some people, about thirty people, who had been Buddhists for a long time, but they never knew what the Buddha did at all. They didn't know anything about it. They only know they've been declared Buddhists and they really want to know what it is the Buddha did, uh, but um, they don't have any knowledge of why they're Buddhists or what it means at all. So one of the things I, I pointed to in the situation was one of the things that's neat about being a Buddhist is that we don't think so much about heaven and hell while we're living this life like some people would in other faiths. When I was a Christian, I had to die to get to heaven. When I became a Buddhist, it became very, very clear that every day of your life, you can get up and make that day either heaven or hell. So when you say hell and hell realms, this is very, very, you know, variation. What's, the, what's so important about stealing a pencil or stealing a few pieces of paper at work and bringing them home for your copy machine? Just maybe 10 pages. Well, there's 300 people that work there. That's 3,000 pages. <laughs> you know, a one ream of paper a day goes out of that office and they have 10 offices. That's about five boxes. You know? So, you know, this all adds up. We're contributing to it. But if you do something that is a small theft or a small mistake, it's personally up to you. God is not watching you, going to punish you, going to strike you dead if you do something. Okay. It's not the same as what we worried about constantly in Christianity. He's going to come and get you, you know? And the thing is that you, your instructions in Buddhism are if you break a precept, you immediately take your precept again. 
I don't care if you want to go to the men's room and sit there and just do it there, or you want to just bow your head and take it yourself or sit there for a moment and write it out on a notepad, the five precepts, but you take them again, right then. You are teaching yourself not to break them. Why are they so important? That, that's it, right? Why are they so important is because hell is right around the corner in the form of the hindrances is the first level of hell. Hindrances are the first level of hell. So when I teach you, when I teach you about the, uh, about the, uh, when I teach you the, um, about the, um, the um, precepts and the hindrances, I always teach you this way, all right? Now, let's see. May told me if I do that, it's gone. <laughs> there you go. All right. So here we go. Here are the precepts. You know, you have the five precepts, but we're just going to do it this way. We're just going to draw. Oops, that's in the wrong place. Oh, I knew I was going to do that. Okay. Okay, okay. And we're gonna make it a purple umbrella. No, we'll make it a yellow one. I like yellow ones. Okay. And we have to turn it into a drawing, right? Okay, so I'm gonna draw this umbrella. Okay, this umbrella is gonna have one, two, Three, four, five points on it. And this umbrella is constructed of the five precepts. No kill, no steal. No wrong sexuality. Mm -hmm. No, um, what's the next one? <laughs> Somebody tell me. <laughs> See, false. no, what is it? False speech. Um, oh yeah, no, no, um, no lies, gossip. Here you go. Slander. And the last one. What's that one? No. Uh, no, no uh, intoxicants, alcohol, um, drugs. No drugs or alcohol. Now, the importance of this umbrella is that when this person When this person is underneath this umbrella, and they're they're here, okay. You know, I've been playing with the doodle thing, right? <laughs> so this person is protecting themselves from this kind of acid rain. And the acid rain that's coming down Is lust and greed, getting caught in lust and greed, hatred, aversion, restlessness, oops, not, well, I'm doing it, it's okay, restlessness, guilt, remorse, 
sloth, torpor, and doubt. So here's, here's what you have to say to yourself. You run your own life. Last night I was trying to explain to these young people, they have, when they're born, their parents also buy a ship for them. And when they own this ship, the only person that's going to handle the ship, the only person that's going to have anything to do with that ship is them. They're the only ones that get to steer it. Only you get to steer that ship. Nobody else is going to take care of it. Just remember that. So when you're going through life, you formulate how easy or how difficult it's going to be for you to pass through life. This is what's happening. You break these precepts, you kill, you, uh, you uh, steal, you um, have wrongful sex, or you lie and cheat and, and that sort of thing, or contribute to gossip or slander somebody or you start to get into drugs and alcohol, what's going to happen to you is the payback. So now what this person is showing you is an umbrella. And these are the, these are the precepts. Okay. So we say, you know, here are the precepts. Umbrella. And here are the hindrances attacking that person. So the Buddha showed you this. He didn't tell you you have to do it. Nobody ordered you to do this. No monk should have ever ordered you to do it in Sunday school. Even your parents, they can sort of, yeah, try to rear you and help and get strict with you about this. But the fact is you're going to go through the rest of your life and you better learn how this works. Because right here under the umbrella, okay, Underneath this umbrella, underneath here is the foundations for heaven. And each day that you live, you form a heaven or you surrender by doing something by out, you cheat, you take, you do break one of the precepts and you produce karma that's the karma you produce and when you produce the karma the action of killing stealing or doing one of the wrong things breaking the precepts you're opening the door for these guys to get through the umbrella each time you do something you're causing a hole in the umbrella see that and if you cause those holes and you do not patch them up and patching them up means that you need to take your precepts again, take your precepts again and patch them up. You see, you're living a life where you get to patch these holes up. Yeah. If you don't patch them up by taking the precepts again and asking the precepts to help you and try again and 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 again beep beep and you keep doing it until your brain says, oh, you want to live this way so you can have an experience of, um, mm -hmm. you can have an experience of, oops, we didn't get the right one. Where's the right one? I don't remember where it is. Let's try that one. What does that one do? Oh, well, anyway, this is heaven. <laughs> Pink is heaven. Pink is heaven. Pink is wonderful vibrations, loving kindness, compassion, forgiveness. This is what's under the umbrella with you. Okay. And if you break the precepts, these guys up here, they can get in there and they can, um, can attack you. Oops. I don't understand what I'm doing here. Uh -uh. I need to play more with this. <laughs> I don't have time to play with this here. Yeah, it's not working. Okay. Anyway, these these droplets these droplets are um, are the 
these irritants, these are irritants that come to your life. So what are they? They're Kamapala. See, now these might not come right away. So that's why you doubt what I'm saying right now, because you might steal something yesterday and you don't feel any different today. But here's these, these attack you in a couple of different ways. But one of the main ways they happen is, you know, if you take whatever, you ever hear the expression, what goes around comes around? Do you ever hear that expression? Bendy, did you ever hear that expression? What goes around comes around. Yes. What you put out, you get back. Do you ever hear that sort of, in most languages, they have an expression like this. This is what we're talking about here. Whatever you do to another person, that is how they will do it back onto you. So the Christians have it, everybody has it, the Muslims have it, everybody has this in there, the Jews have it too. The Jews have a unique way out of it, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> Once, once a year, there's this big prayer thing that the men can go to and it forgives them for everything for that year in one big bang, right? Like that. And then they start with a fresh slate. I was shocked when I heard about that. I'm not sure I even believe it, but, but um, they do have the moral setup for good living. And it's how you, you uh, deal with this. And the whole system that we have here is similar. In, get, in, in you understanding that um, you pre create, this is what I was telling you. You're talking to me about when you die, where am I gonna go, okay? I'm talking to you about what's happening, what's happening right here, right now today, see? And so when I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you like this. Here is a blank page, white paper. Everybody here should take a blank piece of white paper and you put it up on the wall where you're going to see it every morning or when you get in the bedroom or put it up on a ceiling if you want. So you look at it before you go to bed every night. OK, and this blank picture, this this is a blank page is is one day. That's what it is. And in your mind, every day you are going to paint this picture. You are the artist, you have a choice. You can use any of these colors. You can use, um, you know, dark blacks and browns and stuff like that. If it was a bad, sad day, whites and browns and blacks like that. You can use sky blues and sea blues and all beautiful greens and colors for flowers and all that, purples and everything. That was a happy day. That was really a lot of smiling and everything. If you have an overly pink day, that means there was a lot of joy there that day. And you can, you can make your own painting. I'm trying to get the kids that I'm working with now to start making their own picture of each day to see what happens. How do they paint their day? And then when it's finished, you leave it alone, you put it in the past, you decide what you're gonna to do tomorrow. These pictures, they don't keep going. You see, you make that every day. So the question is, do we need to overwork the idea? The Chinese have a way of overworking the idea of life and death. And let's get really heavily involved in merit to protect ourselves. And yes, merit will help if you did something wrong and you do merit to help yourself, um, you know, cancel out the bad action that you did. That's one way of balancing the scales. These scales, though, are absolutely real. For example, I don't know how old are you are, how old you are. Offendi, how old are you? Uh, 44. Okay, well, of course, in your life, I say anybody over 25, I've never met anybody over 25 who could say they didn't have anything that they did wrong before that. They have nothing to worry about. And uh, I never met anybody over 25 who could say to me they never had anything they did when they were younger that, didn't, that they, it never came around and hit them later on. See, you might be cruel to somebody in the third grade and when you're 21, meet them in a store and they might trip you on the way out. 
because you did something really mean to them in third grade. <laughs> I, I was coaching a man one time. He was doing forgiveness and he, he wrote me a letter. He says, the darnest thing happened to me. I went to the store and I actually met this woman and they were still living in the same area. And he had gone away and become a doctor and big important person and everything. They weren't in the same social status, you know, group. But he remembered this girl. And when he went up to her, to, she said, hi, she remembered him. And, in, and the thing was, when he saw her, he just went uh, like that because he remembered what he did to her in third grade. This is a funny story. And he had stopped doing forgiveness. But he, when he was driving back from the store to his house, he started doing forgiveness that night for what he had done to her in third grade. He had humiliated her. He would sit behind her and pull her pigtails until she's twisting like this and saying, stop it, stop it. And the teacher would say, what is that? What are you talking about? Why are you disturbing my class? And he would go, I am not disturbing your class. She is. <laughs> and she used to get in trouble all the time in third grade. Okay, Effendi. And he's like in his 60s now. And he remember they meet each other and remember, and he felt guilty and restless about that. He went back to forgiveness and kept forgiving her until it was wiped clean. And then he saw her again in the store and he just felt fine. So he cleaned something out. So this was stuck inside of him all those years. And he was a kind man. He was, he was a, a, a obstetrical surgeon for women. He was a kind person, but he had this thing inside him, this knot, you see? So what we're talking about is he was carrying around a part of hell in his life. That's what we're talking about. So when you say to me, hell, and we talk about all these realms, the place that, where, where are you living now? Where are you living? Are you? In Indonesia. Indonesia, okay. In Malaysia, they have a place called Chin Sui, and we go up there in the mountains to have this retreat. And it's a huge Chinese temple, huge place. And they have the six, nine stations of hell. <laughs> <laughs> and they made it like an amusement park and you're supposed to walk through this thing and i'm telling you it's just like disneyland but it's not pleasant at all the nine stages of hell and <laughs> i have pictures of them someplace i sent them to david because david was very much fixating very very much studying and concentrating the hells and the heavens and the levels and everything and i'm there come back come back come back to earth you know because he was all wrapped up in this so do you understand what i drew here is i'm showing you that these precepts are a protection against these hindrances these hindrances are the fruits of your actions the fruits of them so when you when you decide when you do something what is it that happens when you do something what is the karma how does it work first you have an intention that one measures the weight of it. And then what happens is, um, this is like the cheetah part, cheetah, right? Okay, I gotta do this the right way. Whoops, okay. I, I lost my, is that right? Oops, I, I lost my, there's a, there's a button on this thing I have to learn about. <laughs> I keep touching the button, there we go. Okay, the first one is intention. And that one is the Chaitana. Okay. The second one is the, um, the action. And that one is the comma. That is the comma. That is actually it is the action. Okay. The third one is the um, uh, Vipaka. Vipaka now has been uh, has taken over the last definition has been removed and they say we pocket is the result of comma we pocket is not the result of comma this is the ripening the ripening of the action that's in the old old dictionaries we look back and we can find we pocket was the ripening so here was the intention to grow an apple right so this was the chaitana 
So here's the seed of the apple. Okay, and the comma was to plant the seed and then uh, plant the seed in the ground and start to grow the tree. See, like that. And then Vipaka is when the flowers come out and they start to ripen and they turn into the apple. And then the Kamapala, come, the comma, you take comma again and you say fruit, Kamapala. That is the fruit of the action. So actually that, that is the apple. That one is the apple here. That's the apple. Forget about this one. This is just another flower. <laughs> there you go. That's another flower. But these flowers, they turn into apples, okay? So here you are, you have an intention. You're gonna do something, cheat, steal a pen, steal some paper, whatever it is you're gonna do, or have a big party binge or something, I don't know. Then you actually do it here, and then you go home, if it was a party binge, and you throw up all night. <laughs> You feel really rotten and you go to bed, but you have trouble sleeping and you got a headache. And here's where you're throwing up and you're getting really sick. That's, that's the payback. So what I'm telling you is when you're 25 and up, I don't know anybody that had something back here. They did something to somebody, something in third grade, something. And then it's going to come around and kick you. And that's what I call a karmic... This is my own name, karmic kickback. <laughs> and that's where whatever you did, it comes back and it bites you. And, and why did it happen? Because you broke the precepts. You collapsed your umbrella. You caused a, a hole in the umbrella. And then those things came in that were the hindrances where you had sloth and torpor, you couldn't sleep, you've had restlessness, guilt, and remorse. And when you took whatever it was, it was lust and, and greed. And then you can even turn the hatred and aversion on yourself. And then you had doubt about the whole thing. Maybe I shouldn't do that again. Maybe I should stay under the umbrella. You see? So the Buddha thought about all this. He experienced all this. He has all those Jataka tales. Oh my gosh. You know, he has all these stories and these are the, the stories that, that tell you about all the things that were happening to him all that time. And he had all these experiences and he, he tested everything. And so by the time he gets here, when the Buddha's here, he has all this information for us. He try, when he starts to teach, he's, he's backed up by a hundred thousand lifetimes of going through what you're going through right now in every aspect you can. And how much loving kindness should we have? How much forgiveness should we have? When he was born as a baby and his father was jealous of the baby and only wanted the wife who was very beautiful to pay attention to him, he decides to kill the child. What does he do? He cuts off the baby's hands and the, the Buddha remembers the Bodhisattva. He, he doesn't get angry at his father. He doesn't, he doesn't hate his father. He keeps his mind pure. He cuts his feet off. He's still, he's still there in his mother's arms. She's going crazy. But the, but the Bodhisattva just looks at his father's eyes and is sending him loving kindness and forgiveness because he's his father. He doesn't understand. And then he cuts his head off and he's dead. That's how he had a tough time. <laughs> I mean, he had a tough time. This is the extreme of that story. But these stories are kept for us to try to look at those and to remember. To remember what? To remember that he gave us a whole system. Not just a piece of it, but a whole system. That's what's remarkable about Buddhism. You see? When everybody died in my family, I don't know if you read the little book that I wrote or not, you know, online, but if you read it, when those people died in the family, I was just devastated so badly. And I couldn't get over one person before the next one died, before the next one died, before the next one killed over, before the last one died, for then my mother died. So first, you know, the bang, 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 bang. I felt in those days, like 
God is testing me. We would say God is testing you. He's trying to see if you can carry the burden. My grandmother would say, you know that God didn't give you anything that was too hard for you to carry because as a human being, he will carry you if he needs to. He will never give you something you can't get through. It's all a test. She would tell us this when I was little. So I kept waiting for him to just fly down from the sky and put a flagstone in front of me so I could keep walking because I was so devastated. I was wiped out crying. I was dehydrated. It was a horrible, horrible, horrible experience. You know, there were no, go to the priest, you go to the ministers. Yes, I know it's death. We come from dust. We go to dust, dust to dust. Thank you. That's what you're going to say. You're not going to tell me how anything works. <laughs> and I find Buddhism when I'm 50 years old and I'm there. Whoa, wait a second. How come nobody's talking about this thing? And how can anybody say to you that Buddhism is pessimistic? That's my favorite one. How can anybody say to you that Buddhism is pessimistic? You can't be kidding me. It has all these answers for you. I just explained to you why you shouldn't be stealing, what's going to happen to you, or why you shouldn't break the precepts, and how you're protected by the precepts to protect you from the hindrances. What I just told you about was heaven or hell in this lifetime. Learning about where you're going to go next time is based on what you do this time. So come back to Earth and get ready for tomorrow, <laughs> okay? That's the reality here. And put your paper up and start painting your days and see how you're doing with your perception or your perspective of how you see life. Do you see it as pink and oranges and purples and chartreuse and these wonderful, great, vibrant, psychedelic colors? Or do you see it as darkness and heaviness and overwhelming gloom and blackness and everything because you just went through a bad time? You remember you have a friend in a Nietzsche if that happens because everything is changing and whatever was isn't now and doesn't have to be again, if we remember it, that this too shall pass. And then what do you have when this too shall pass? Leave it behind in a box and put up a new paper and start again and paint a new day, okay? That's what you look at it. So I expect to see pinks, oranges, and uh, I think you should go look up the artist Matus, M-A-T-E-U-S, I think it is, Matus. Matus was a French artist, and look at the colors, the vibrancy, the colors. It's extraordinary. I went to see another, another, um, another impressionist artist in the gallery about a month later. And it was a local artist and he did paintings that were six feet by 10 feet high. And everything in the whole gallery, when they hung the gallery for the exhibit, was brown and darker brown and gray brown and black and brown and light brown. And that, the different positions on the canvas, but all of it was dark. Dark, 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 dark. So you went in the gallery and you walked around this wall and that wall and through that room and the other room and the other room and through that one. And then you had to walk out of the gallery. And the man, the, actually the group, I don't know who did this, but it was wonderful. You felt so much oppression looking at this collection of art. You felt so depressed by the time you got through looking at 30 paintings that were black and brown and gray and this way. And you went out the door, Matus, the parrot drawing of Matus. There was a parrot. He painted a parrot in a window with a jungle behind it. Matus was like this facing you and you went, oh, like when you went out of the room, you looked at Matus and you went, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Whoever hung that room and I, they said, how did you like the exhibit? I said to them, it was fantastic. The people who hung that exhibit did the best job. And I walked out of the gallery. <laughs> 
I didn't like the exhibit. <laughs> I thought it was terrible. <laughs> but the last thing I saw in my mind, you see what's in your mind. Mind is the forerunner of everything. And my next morning had no idea of that exhibit even existed. My mind was on Matus. You see? So what you see, not what you think and ponder, that's nice, what you see and ponder, what you hear and ponder, what you smell and ponder, what you say and ponder, that determines your whole disposition and whether you're gonna get depressed or you're gonna be happy, it's up to you. Cause you know why? You know why? Because it's your ship. It's your ship, you are steering it. It's your choice, see? And uh, I don't know if the artist of that exhibit probably figured out what was going on. I hope he didn't go and take the Matus away because it would be very sad, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> And it, it was a beautiful gesture for somebody to put that there. I think they thought people would not come to the gallery. They would pass around the word and no one would come. But then when I went to a tea house after I went to that gallery, it's a long time ago this happened. I went to the tea house to get some coffee, you know, and I'm sitting there, I'm listening to people say, did you see the Natus? <laughs> Nobody was saying, did you see the gray and brown and black and the black and brown and gray? And <laughs> they weren't saying that. They were saying, did you see the Matus? Pretty sure it's Matus. I hope the name is right. <laughs> so you guys got to go check on it, okay? Okay, everybody happy here? Yeah, you got okay. one? Okay. Good can I man. ask a question? Yes, you can ask a question. Okay, uh, so earlier tonight you mentioned um, uh, this statement which um, uh, interests me. Um, naturally trust the practice for the development of everything. Um, I was linking it to what Bhante Vimala Ramsi used to say about, you know, if we protect the Dhamma, the Dhamma protects us. So my question is, how do we know we've done enough to protect the Dhamma that we will be okay? What's enough? Yeah, what's enough <laughs> is the question. <laughs> I don't think there is an enough. Um, the one thing I could say to everybody with this is play, play with it. Yeah. For the advanced students, for instance, um, you know, uh, for advanced students, um, they're already on a track of their own, however, they're managing it with it and their development and everything. For new students, definitely when you're teaching, the biggest thing is the playfulness of this practice. Play with it. Do not be afraid when you are even just a bare beginner to take this and take it into life with you and start using it the best you can. So what is the very least you can do to test what happens when you go into life? Smile at someone. When everybody's down at the coffee clutch, when they're getting coffee in the morning, go in there and smile and keep sending out loving kindness to the people who are all looking down on Monday morning and see what happens with that. See, we don't, when we are, um, you know, there's so many aspects to this because you're discovering that you do affect the world around you. Everybody affects the world around us. We are not isolated in a pea pod. You know, there's more than one pea in a pea pod. <laughs> I mean, there's some, yeah, most of the beans, they come in pods, you know? It's uh, the brothers and sisters of the pea, I guess, I don't know, <laughs> little families of peas. But when popping them out, I, I said to my mom, why is there always five peas in a pea pod, five or six peas, not just one? Hmm, she didn't have, she, I used to ask the, all these questions so she could sit there and say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but we we are not isolated in the world. We we all feed the mother. Who is the mother? It's the earth. It's the earth and the atmosphere and the trees and everything. We need to reconnect. 
one of the biggest reasons there isn't any peace in the world for a, a, you know a strong sort of steady peace in the world is because of the disconnection of the human beings from the actual surface of the earth i knew i knew i was in trouble once when i drove my daughter she was about mm, seven or eight years old i had her in the car and i drove through the bank to deposit a paycheck through the tube to the inside of the bank in Maryfield, Virginia. And as I'm sitting in the car and we're underneath the little roof and I'm putting this in there, it started to rain. And my little daughter, she looks out the window at all the stuff that is around us where this is in this little bank where I'm depositing this in the tube. And she just says, mommy, and I said, yeah, when it rains like this, do the buildings grow? Now, the thing is, this was not a joke. The thing was, this was a serious question because all she could see when I looked out the window, I couldn't see any trees anymore. I couldn't see any grass anywhere. I could only see parking lots and shopping centers and, and a tall buildings and short buildings and a vast area in a whole 360 degree circumference. When I drove out of there, I could not see a single tree. That's when it hit me. I had brought her up to live in the city with me and I was disconnecting her from all that I knew about the forest, about the mountains, about the streams, about, you know, um, Here's, you may think I'm crazy, but when the kids came in her class and they were talking about what their parents did, 85 or 90% of the kids in her class, there were about 30 kids, they're talking about the, what do their parents do, and they were talking about what they do for a living, were sitting in front of a computer screen in one of those buildings. See? So then I, what, what hit me was, so they're never going to hear the wind and they don't know that the trees talk and they can't hear the grass communicating with them when it blows through the wind blows through it and they don't know the touch of sand and dirt in their hands and the human being was never supposed to be totally disconnected when i went to uh, korea in uh, Seoul, Korea, I realized they planned that city differently. Here in India, it's a disaster, a disaster. They're not gonna, they're not gonna die of some virus or something pretty, they'll have a real hot spell. And then you're gonna find most of them dead because there's no wind between the buildings because people buy their apartments with a view. And when the next building's built, they see the view is the window into the apartments in the next building. And there's no, no measurement of earth and grass and trees and how oxygen comes to be in the air. And this is why I, I've gotten sick in the last couple of years here. This is, what, this is what is pulling me down so bad. So I think I can still do the work I wanna do here, but I think I absolutely have to get out of here for the hot season from April, May, June, and July. If I come back in August, I think, the rest of the year, I think I'm, I'm okay, okay? But people don't understand what they've done. Well, I think they're torturing the puppy again. You know, I have bright days and dark days. I'm just hoping the puppy doesn't scream on one of the dark days because I'm liable to take my cane and go out there and poke the kids who are poking the puppy to make him squeal. That will not be good for the neighborhood. <laughs> See that you can hear the kids trying to scream and now they're going to start poking him and the puppy's going to start crying again. It's a, it's a sad place here. When you live in a place where people don't believe that dogs can feel anything. <laughs> and I've never spent enough time with a dog to see it smile or laugh or cry or, you know, and they don't know any, they don't have any idea, man, Dogs are man's best friend. But now let's let's steer around. I'm from a different society and say, how can that be happening here? And should we go over there and, and try to straighten it out? You will wait a second. If you feed everybody in the world 
and you house everybody in the world and they have the basic requisites of clothing and medicine in the world, then you're not gonna have any problem with the animals anymore. So my message to the world is if you are spending your time fighting for the rights of animals, you need to retune, recalibrate, and start working as hard as you're working for those animals, for the human beings that are where I'm living now and for other places like this. Because if we fix the human beings, you will fix the whole relationship between human beings and animals. I'm not putting down the work you're doing, please understand. I just think you need, you didn't go far enough on the calculation. So when you, when you speak, I've seen terrible articles written about what happens over here and other countries like this. Before you do that, think you need to close your eyes and figure out what it is to survive. Because the people I work with have to survive first, day to day, getting enough food, and the food they get here is bee food, meaning you buy it, you eat it that day, or it's going to rot tomorrow. That's it's that gone by. It's not in the regular supermarket. You buy the apple, you, you should cut them before you bite them, because if they're rotting, they're rotting from the inside out. If they're genetically engineered, that's funny. I have a picture of that. I cut the apple open. And the apple is rotting from the inside core out towards the outside of the apple. Something is wrong. I grew up with apples and apple farms, okay? Apple orchards. The apple has to be infected by a worm or a hole has to be in it and it rots from the outside in. It doesn't rot from the inside out. So when you find peaches that are rotting from the inside seed out or the apple is rotting, from the inside outwards in a ring, evenly through the whole apple, it's rotting from the inside out. You know that we have gone too far with fooling around with genetically engineering food. And they're doing this so they can sell that apple. This much of the top of the apple is solid. So if you push, you touch the apple, you can't tell the apple's going bad because it's solid for that deep. The rest of the whole entire apple is bad and they won't let you take it back to them. It's just bee food. They're just trying to get the bee food uh, that's left over from the markets that test for their food when they buy it, and then they pass it off on the poorer communities. That's what happens, okay? So we need to, um, yeah, we, okay. I do that, I do, I do. Swipe, swipe, swipe. <laughs> I can't stop the call. It's really funny. Hi, I can't stop the call. I'm almost finished class. Please call me back in five minutes, okay? Okay. <laughs> I, honestly, I don't understand who designed these phones. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I now have eight different ways that you can communicate with me. Can you imagine that? I grew up with a telephone, you pick up the phone and you talk on it like this. And hello, hi, Effendi, how are you? And I'm only with you, Effendi, and there's no bells, no one's selling me anything, no, nothing's happening. When I say goodbye to you, that's the end of my call. And then Everett calls me and hello, Everett, how are you doing? How is you, are you okay? Oh, that's good, good. Oh, I hope I see you there. I'll be there soon. Goodbye. And then May calls me. Life was good before they said we need to make it faster. <laughs> not only that, I am not going to take the time to write back to each one of you to tell you why I didn't call you back. And if there's eight different ways for me to have people communicating with me, I don't want you to get mad if I don't go into LinkedIn or messaging or instant messaging or Telegram or KitKat or CatKit or whatever to check and see if you said something to me because I have other things to do. <laughs> and my favorite thing is, will somebody please tell me how this phone uh, how the flight thing gets turned on when I didn't do it? And how does it get muted so people think I'm not calling them back? And do you know how hateful people can get if you didn't call them back? 
<laughs> but I used to have to get ring, ring, ring. Oh, Everett, I'm so sorry. I wanted to ask you. I forgot one thing. What was it you wanted me to bring? Okay, I'll I'll remember. Okay, bye. Was that what kind of wine? Oh, Gatorade wine. Oh, Gatorade. Okay, bye. <laughs> It's like, it's so fun. Communication was fun. Now it's scary. It is scary. <laughs> and the worst thing is you don't know whether to take the phone to bed with you or not, because if you put it under your pillow and it goes down below 10%, then the radiation increases. And in the end, they're going to say death by phone. Anyway, okay, let's call it a day. We're done. This is life. Embrace it. Love it. Laugh with it. Play with it. Don't hurt anybody. Don't hurt yourself. And put a white piece of paper up and start painting your days and see what they're really like. And you do something wrong, clean it up. Take your precepts again and get back on the, what is that? The Golden Gate Bridge. It's like, get back on the red road. <laughs> picture of the, the, the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, the American Indians say stay on the red road. And if you fall off the red road, then correct yourself, get back up and keep walking on the red road. Well, the Buddhists have the same thing. But it's not the Buddhist problem. He doesn't care. Uh, you, know, you know, he just laid it all out for you. What works? What doesn't work? It's up to you to figure out how to make it work the way he said it was working. You know, and everybody in this generation, I want you to know, is supposed to keep asking questions. You don't just do what somebody tells you to do because they did it that way and it wasn't working for them. And they've been doing it for 50 years and they didn't get very far, but they're telling you this is the way you do this. You got to test things for yourself and you got to try out things. And if, if, if it doesn't make sense, you know, if, if there were all these soda panas, all these sakuragamis running around, and then the way to do this is if they're not happening and we're doing it, we're saying it slightly wrong, what we'll decide to tell you is it could take you 1,000 years to become a soda pana. That's a new story. Come on. Come on. Come back to earth. Read the instructions. Talk about this openly. Talk to people that are, that are working at the same level you're, le you're working at and check it out. See if you can get it to work, okay? All right, here we go. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, the devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect this Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. The bell is happy, the bell is happy, the bell is happy. <laughs> have a good week, have fun, keep laughing, give your smiles away, and just keep going, you know? Try some things we talked about. Let me know what happens next time when we get together, okay? And we'll keep working with you, okay? Don't worry, we will. No matter where we are, we will, <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay, I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.